Welcome. Uh, today, we're going to answer the question, what is exciting about medical ethics? Uh, this is sort of an invitation uh, into this semester's course uh, that we're going to be doing by looking at the first chapter of uh, this brief textbook that I've assigned for the course. Uh, this book right here, which is uh, a short, a very short introduction to medical ethics uh, by uh, Michael Dunn and Tony Hope. Uh, so I'm just going to flag some of the important points um, in chapter one. Uh, I'm also going to introduce you to a useful uh, method of thinking through cases in medical ethics that goes beyond the textbook. And uh, we'll preview a case study uh, that's going to emerge uh, next week. So we're going to dip a little bit into chapter two of our book by Dunn and Hope as well. So let's get to it. The main idea that Dunn and Hope want to get across, uh, well, medical ethics can be exciting uh, because it appeals to not just one sort of person, but many sorts of people. So on the one hand, uh, medical ethics um, is a great field for uh, broad philosophical questions and general philosophizing, looking into big concepts. So for instance, in the context of medical ethics, we can look at a question like, what are uh, the essential parts of informed consent? Or what's the difference between a competent patient and an incompetent patient? Uh, and we're going to have to think philosophically to answer those questions. Uh, but we can also spend time thinking about very specific real world policies. What should we do in this case? Uh, what should the laws in our country be, right? Uh, so just to take one example, uh, Dunn and Hope uh, would be willing to say that like, yeah, a big question for medical ethics, this doesn't come up in their text, uh, but it would be an important question to answer. What strategies can a healthcare worker employ uh, when they're dealing with a patient who is hesitant to take vaccines? Uh, so given that uh, vaccines are controversial, although it's the widely accepted view within the medical profession that uh, though there are actual risks involved with vaccines, uh, the benefits that they provide are actually much greater than the risks. Uh, and within that framework, uh, we're going to realize that sometimes healthcare workers are going to encounter patients uh, who will refuse to take a vaccine, even if it's in their best interests. Well, on the one hand, uh, one strategy might be to simply do what the patient asks, uh, but there might be other strategies of engaging that patient in conversation about, say, their reasons for refusal. Uh, and sometimes, healthcare workers have sometimes found uh, that sometimes these uh, refusals uh, might be flexible, at least in the context of some vaccines in some situations. Uh, and uh, within this context of the importance of medical ethics, uh, Dunn and Hope also note that uh, there's an important interplay between law and ethics. Uh, so in a certain way, they are interconnected. Uh, but they will also point out that ethics constrains law in a way that law does not constrain ethics. So, uh, this is to say, uh, we may in some cases say, look, these are the laws, uh, but we might still find them unethical. That's a way in which we might say, in those situations, uh, if we realize from an ethical point of view that the laws are problematic, we should change the laws, right? But when we find that laws and ethics disagree, uh, we shouldn't change our ethical views simply saying, well, the law says this and that's that. In fact, what we're doing with ethics is to say, well, these are what the laws are, and we need to know the answer to those questions much of the time. Uh, but ethics takes a further step and asks what the law should be. Uh, so in this way, we can say, yes, this is the law, 
but is the law itself ethically defensible? And if it isn't, we should work to change the law. Now, we might also notice in some cases that uh, you may change your judgment about a person's ethical obligations because certain laws are in place. Uh, we do have some duties to respect certain laws, um, and breaking the law is not something that a medical practitioner should engage in lightly. Uh, but we might say uh, it's not always the case uh, that just answering questions about what the law is will determine what our ethical duties are. Now, here's another way we can get into this line of thought that different sorts of people, right, different sorts of people uh, can find medical ethics attractive. Well, uh, Dunn and Hope uh, refer to this distinction between hedgehogs and foxes. So this is a distinction about different ways of thinking and different ways of looking at the world. Uh, and this distinction was made popular through an essay by the philosopher Isaiah Berlin, uh, although Berlin found it in a fragment from the Greek poet Archilochus. Uh, so here's how the distinction is supposed to work. Uh, here's how a hedgehog thinks. Uh, a hedgehog is a thinker with uh, one system, uh, less or more coherent or articulate, in terms of which they understand, think, and feel. A single universal organizing principle in terms of which alone all that they say has significance. So this is the idea that making sense of the world should be understood in terms of one big important idea. Uh, now, uh, Berlin uh, flagged certain thinkers as uh, being hedgehogs in their style of thought. So thinkers like Plato and thinkers like Hegel, for instance, uh, were thought of as hedgehogs because they want to make the whole system and everything that they think fit into uh, a single big picture. Whereas on the other hand, some people think not like a hedgehog, but like a fox. So here's how the fox thinks. Uh, these are thinkers who pursue many ends, often unrelated and even contradictory, connected, if at all, only in some de facto way. That is, they're connected only insofar as uh, these are things that you think. So the fox leads a life, performs acts, uh, that seizes upon a vast variety of experiences without seeking to fit them all into any one unchanging, all-embracing, unitary inner vision. So the hedgehog might have, might have one idea, but the fox is going to understand the world in terms of a number of different principles that might not all fit together. Uh, so uh, I believe that in the text, uh, some of the examples of fox-like thinkers, uh, we got uh, Shakespeare, uh, Aristotle, among others. Uh, so within this picture, uh, the fox might uh, use one mode of thinking for one kind of problem in one situation and a different mode of thinking and a different uh, line of thought for another problem. Uh, and the concern about fitting everything into one single unified vision uh, is something that the fox does not worry about too much. So I'll invite you to think about whether you want to understand the world in terms of one big idea or a lot of smaller ideas. Uh, this is uh, the phrase that goes back to Archilochus. Archilochus tells us that the hedgehog knows one big thing, the fox knows a lot of little things. Now, I'll remark, uh, Dunn and Hope in the book uh, basically come right out and tell us uh, that they think like foxes, right? Uh, so there won't be one single idea or principle that's going to be used to understand every single part of medical ethics. They're going to use different tools for different problems, as it were. Uh, 
there are uh, certain hedgehog style ways of thinking about medical ethics. Uh, so for instance, uh, there are, for instance, some people who understand medical ethics primarily in religious terms. So they might say the first thing and the last thing we need to think about in medical ethics might be something like the sanctity of life, uh, that our lives are a gift from God, uh, and doing medicine correctly is correctly respecting and honoring that gift from God. This is a view that we might call a sanctity of life view. Uh, a non-religious example of thinking like a hedgehog uh, is a view that we'll come upon very soon, and it's a view called utilitarianism. So the utilitarian is a person who tries to answer every ethical question in terms of a single principle or a single question. And their question is, does this action create the most overall happiness possible? Uh, and in that way, we might think of uh, that utilitarian principle, much like the sanctity of life principle, as a single unifying thought uh, that helps us navigate the ethical world. <coughs> okay, so this is the way in which uh, there are different temperaments which uh, can get different things out of med medical ethics, and that's a great thing. The cool thing about medical ethics is that it gives us a variety of topics, a variety of puzzles, and to a large extent, a variety of methods uh, are welcome within this field. <coughs> so, uh, one really interesting thing about medical ethics is that uh, it's more practical than other parts of philosophy. Uh, usually, if you get advanced training in philosophy, uh, one of the main things that you can hope to do is teach philosophy to other people. Uh, but we should notice that within medical ethics, that's not really true. Uh, people with advanced training in medical ethics might teach medical ethics to other people, uh, but many other people with training in medical ethics will work clinically. That is, there are hospitals and healthcare networks that will have a paid professional ethicist on call. Uh, and these paid professional ethicists uh, will uh, be the person that doctors, nurses, patients uh, can call when they're encountering a tough case. So uh, Dunn and Hope flag that there are different things that you can do as a medical ethicist. So, one thing that the medical ethicist can do is simply clarify conflicting views about the right thing to do. So for instance, uh, if we have disagreement uh, within a family about, say, whether to take a patient off of life support or whether to remove uh, a feeding tube, uh, the ethicist might be able to come in and talk with the doctors, talk with the nurses, uh, and different family members about what their values are in this case. And they might, for instance, point out that maybe some people on the case are mainly concerned with relieving suffering, whereas other people dealing with the case might be more concerned about respect for sanctity of life. And in this way, they can at least uh, bring clarity to a disagreement understand here are the facts on the table, but here are the ways in which the different parties in the dispute might have different values. So in this way, the medical ethicist is about clarifying uh, the different views within a disagreement, which can actually lead to much better conversations. Second, uh, the medical ethicist can sometimes operate as what Dunn and Hope call a gadfly. This is to provoke society to be less complacent about the way things are done. Uh, that is, encouraging people to think and act differently. Uh, so this metaphor of the gadfly uh, goes back to ancient philosophy, 
um, and one of its uh, founding figures and founding texts. Uh, because in uh, Plato, uh, we find a character based on a real person, Socrates, uh, who, when being put on trial for philosophizing, uh, basically characterizes himself as a gadfly uh, that is buzzing around uh, the great horse that is the city of Athens. Basically, what Socrates thought of himself as doing uh, as a philosopher was to ask questions. Uh, oftentimes he asked questions of people who thought themselves to be wise, uh, but whose opinions uh, didn't hold up to scrutiny uh, when Socrates began to ask them questions. So the gadfly metaphor is uh, the metaphor of this sort of annoying fly that is buzzing around a horse, around its ears and its eyes and its butt, uh, trying to provoke that horse uh, to not stand still, to not be lazy, to not be complacent. Third, uh, many times uh, the medical ethicist can help to identify gaps in knowledge. Uh, so they might, for instance, be able to come into conversations where there are disputes and talk about what don't we know? In fact, that's a very philosophical point of view, to be able to say, I don't know something. Uh, in fact, Socrates, one of the other things that he says uh, in this text, the Apology, he says that uh, my true wisdom is knowing uh, that I know nothing at all. Uh, and by identifying gaps in knowledge, the medical ethicist can encourage people to seek out more information uh, and uh, can seek out ways in which maybe we need to be a bit more humble uh, in the pursuit of medicine because oftentimes mistakes are made when uh, a practitioner uh, or sometimes even a patient uh, gets a little bit too uh, self-assured and too certain about how things are going to go. And fourth, uh, Dunn and Hope say sometimes the medical ethicist will act as what we might call a crutch. That is uh, something to lean on, right? Uh, the crutch will be support and guide for practitioners in need of practical advice. So sometimes uh, the medical ethicist might come in and simply answer the question of what should we do in this situation? Uh, sometimes that might be simply in terms of offering advice, and sometimes it might be with the ethicist advocating for a certain view or policy uh, while sitting on an ethics board at a hospital. Uh, so in these ways, we should notice that in different situations, uh, the medical ethicist can do many different things. You know, in these roles as clarifying or acting as the crutch, uh, they might be uh, offering support, helping people find a way out of a difficult issue. Uh, but in other situations, uh, say in the gadfly mode or in the gaps in knowledge mode, uh, they're going to be pointing out, here are all the things that we don't know in this situation. And sometimes in the gadfly mode, beyond saying like, here's what we don't know, they might even say, here's how we need to change things. Uh, here's how we need to slow down. Uh, so yeah, there's Socrates, our original gadfly, and in a certain way, uh, when we do medical ethics, especially when we're saying, look, there are certain things that we do that when we really subject them to critical scrutiny, don't make a lot of sense. Uh, in that way, medical ethics does tie all the way back uh, to the founder of philosophy, Western philosophy, I should say, Socrates. So uh, that's sort of the picture of medical ethics that Dunn and Hope give us. I'll point out that there are a whole bunch of ways to navigate difficult situations. Uh, one of my uh, teachers in medical ethics uh, was this fellow right here, uh, Bill Winslade, William Winslade. And one method for navigating difficult cases 
uh, is to stop and realize that there are certain questions that always come up in different forms in medical ethics. So he said, when we're dealing with patient care, we can ask four questions. And these are the questions of medical indications, patient preferences, quality of life, and contextual features. Let's run through these four questions. So when we're asking about medical indications, uh, this is a question about what the patient's problem is. Uh, and not only what is the problem, but what are the possible solutions? Uh, so for instance, if a patient comes into the ER, well, the indications uh, could be something like, well, this patient has uh, a broken humerus and what they're going to need um, is surgery and then a cast. So it's a problem and uh, the main medical solutions that present themselves. Next, we need to ask questions about patient preferences. Uh, so have we informed patients of all the risks? We could also ask, is the patient refusing treatment? And if so, why? Uh, we might also ask questions about, say, competency. Uh, so is the patient in their right mind, right? Uh, are they able to understand what's going on around them? Uh, and is their uh, stated decision something that's being made uh, rationally? In cases where we have incompetent patients, we can also start to ask whether uh, the proxies, that is, whether the people speaking for the patient are capably uh, speaking to that patient's best interests. Furthermore, we can ask questions about quality of life. So we can ask, what quality of life will the patient enjoy if uh, the indicated treatment succeeds? Uh, we can also ask questions about uh, whether uh, we are using the right standard for quality of life. Uh, should we be using uh, the practitioner's uh, picture of what a life worth living is or what an improvement in one's quality of life would be? Or should we, and this is probably more oftentimes the case, should we trust the patient's judgment about what a good quality of life is and whether the treatment is likely to get them to a quality of life that they find acceptable or not? So these are the kinds of questions uh, that are often emerging in the patient-provider interaction. What's the problem? What are the solutions? What does the patient want? Is the patient competent? Are they informed? And we can also ask the questions about, well, what sorts of harms come along with treatment? What sort of benefits uh, should come along with treatment? And what standard of a good quality of life are we going to be working with in this context? So these first three things are about the relationship between the patient and the provider and how that situation is unfolding. Uh, Winslade and his co-authors also point out that we can be thinking ethically about contextual features. So we might ask questions about whether there are conflicts of interest, that is, uh, situations that might be pushing a provider away from their professional duties. Uh, so for instance, uh, do we have drug companies uh, placing undue influence on a doctor's prescription decisions? Uh, or we might ask questions about society more broadly. Uh, do considerations involving religion or racial discrimination or gender uh, or very many other things have an influence on decision making? Another thing that comes up often when we're thinking about contextual features uh, is money, right? So uh, who is going to pay for the treatment? Uh, what are the financial ramifications of treating a patient in a certain way? That goes beyond uh, the interaction between the doctor, the patient, and the problem, and goes into questions about society in general. So what we get from Winslade here uh, is a method for organizing our thoughts. Uh, an important way that we can be better philosophical thinkers 
um, is to think in a coherent, clear, and organized manner. And what's really useful about this four box or four topics method um, is it helps us to slow down and ask a series of questions that is always going to come up in one way, shape, or form um, in each uh, medical decision that's being made. So let's look at a decision, and this will foreshadow um, our discussion next week. So we're going to look at euthanasia next time around. And here's the case. Uh, and this is a case that comes out of chapter two in our short little book by Dunn and Hope. Uh, Lillian Boys was a 70-year-old patient with very severe rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the pain seemed to be beyond the reach of painkillers. Uh, she was expected to die within a matter of days or weeks. Uh, she asked her doctor, Dr. Cox, to kill her. Uh, and Dr. Cox injected her with a lethal dose of potassium chloride. Uh, I did some more reading on this case. Uh, this is a real case uh, that happened in uh, England. And, uh, you know, the sorts of problems that Lillian was dealing with uh, were problems uh, involving bed sores as well as uh, gastric, that is, stomach ulcers. Uh, and when you have stomach ulcers, uh, that makes your options for uh, painkillers uh, fewer as well. Uh, so, and, and it wasn't as if uh, Dr. Cox immediately injected uh, Ms. Boys, uh, but it was after uh, certain attempts at managing her pain failed. So now we can look at this case, right? We can say, what are the medical indications? Uh, so we might say like, well, that's uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and it seemed like painkillers uh, were what was indicated. Uh, so we've got the problem and we've got the solution. Uh, with more detail, we could also mention things like uh, bed sores and uh, gastric, uh, gastric ulcers. Uh, we can look at patient preferences. Well, there we can notice uh, that Lillian is asking her doctor uh, to be killed. But remember, if we go back, uh, it's not just what the patient is asking for, uh, but we also have to ask the question of uh, why the patient is asking for what they're asking for and whether um, they are doing so competently. Right. So with Ms. Boys, we would have to ask the question about whether this request um, is a competent request uh, that has uh, ethical significance. Third question we can ask, quality of life. Well, in this case with Ms. Boys, we should notice that uh, she does not seem to have uh, much time left to live. And we would also notice uh, that she seems to be in uh, very great pain. Uh, so we would say that, look, um, in the case where uh, trying to manage the pain uh, palliatively, that is, where we're not trying to solve the problem that she has, but we're trying to uh, help her be as comfortable as we can, well, we should notice that uh, we are struggling to succeed in that goal at the moment. Uh, whereas um, it would seem that uh, euthanizing Ms. Boys, that is, intentionally bring about her death uh, would be uh, relief from that suffering. Now the last thing that we'd have to ask is about contextual features. So one thing to notice is that within contextual features uh, we could also include something like uh, the law. Right? Uh, so this was a case that happened uh, in the United Kingdom in the 1990s. Uh, and as it still is, I believe, uh, it was also illegal then uh, for doctors in England to, provi to provide uh, euthanasia, that is a lethal injection aimed at killing a patient. But we should notice that in some other countries, the contextual features would be different. 
right? So in the Netherlands at that time, uh, or in my home country of Canada nowadays, um, it is uh, legal uh, for a healthcare provider uh, to provide uh, euthanasia, that is an active uh, injection uh, aimed at killing a patient. So we might notice that uh, in uh, Dr. Cox's case, he is doing something that is uh, not legal uh, by uh, the laws of his country, and he's doing something that's uh, not legal by the policies of his hospital as well. So we would have to factor that into uh, decision making. Now, I said earlier in this video that uh, the law does not fully answer questions about what's ethical. So we, we could ask two questions here. Uh, did Dr. Cox do something wrong given the laws in his country? We could also ask the question uh, whether uh, the law should be changed to make it uh, perhaps legal and perhaps also uh, more legally regimented uh, for Dr. Cox to carry out uh, Ms. Boy's request. Uh, but this is just uh, a demonstration of how we can use this four boxes method uh, to uh, understand uh, a controversial and interesting medical ethical case. So we're going to keep going with this discussion about euthanasia uh, in the coming week. So next time around, uh, I'd encourage you to read chapter two of Dun and Hope, um, and we'll continue this uh, interesting and really important discussion about uh, the ethics of euthanasia. So thanks for listening in, and take care.